Let us begin, perhaps, with an internet meme that some of you would be familiar with, since I think some of this audience actually sent it to me. And some of you may remember this uh, video that made the rounds a couple of years ago. You may remember seeing a violinist standing in a subway station in Washington, D.C. Uh, that violinist, unlike uh, like so many other buskers too in the world, including people that you have no doubt seen in your own travels, was playing his little fiddle. And as most buskers are, well, he was completely ignored for upwards of an hour. A couple of people stopped by, dropped a couple of dollars in his violin case, but pretty much ignored the violinist as he was playing. Secret to this little experiment was it was conducted by the Washington Post in the Washington uh, subway system, and that simple violinist was Joshua Bell, who would later that day perform at the opulent concert hall in Washington, D.C., using the same $3 million violin that he was playing in the subway station to a packed house to people who spent hundreds of dollars in that very thing. What I mean by that is sometimes, even though you are very sophisticated in the violin or in the sciences, sometimes it takes a little help, a setting, an adjustment, an engagement for the appreciation to actually happen. And I felt that was a kind of a good analogy for what we will be discussing. Now you guys are all very familiar with this, of course, because you are familiar with some of the issues that we have in conservation. Perhaps the most noted one, the most noteworthy one, is the dichotomy between the sciences in terms of what we understand in organizations and group settings such as this, and what the general public gets. Recently a study came up, and I'm sure most of you saw it, whereas 90, over 99% of the published articles relating to climate change, of course, uh, led to the assumption that humans are a cause of it and the temperatures are going up. Now, of course, if science were completely understood and respected and followed by the general public, you would think that the numbers of the general public would coincide with this, and of course, you know that's not the case. It is slightly higher than in, in Canada than in the United States, but still, not a correspondingly large number of people share the same values and interests and abilities that you folks here at the audience have in terms of understanding science. The New York Times speculates that their readership, and that's a very sophisticated readership, has about a 28% percentage of understanding fairly sophisticated sciences. And I'm sure people in the room here would probably attest to that sort of thing with the Florida things that they're developing as well. But that 28% is probably similar to the amount of sophistication people have with the uh, violin concerto that Joshua Bell was playing in the subway station in terms of the general audience. When he was in the concert hall, well, that percentage was, of course, much more constricted and he was with his people. The trick into engaging a novel audience, which is what we're discussing here this evening, Engaging a novel audience is to reach out and connect in some way with the sophisticated knowledge that we have and sharing it to them. And I believe one of the reasons that we have thus far pretty much failed in doing this, particularly as behaviors in the general public have changed over the last number of years, is that we adhere to the same principles that we did in terms of engaging people with science in the 1970s. At back then, information was key, information was more relevant, and people wanted to make other people in the general public understand. Thinking that the first rule to getting an audience uh, to, to get on side with them is to teach them, to generate an understanding. I believe this is no longer the case. This may be a secondary objective, but our first objective is not understanding. It is much more intrinsic to that. It is belief. Belief is very, very important. It stays with us throughout the course of our lives. But one of the difficult and intractable things that we have in generating a belief system is that it is not as evidence-based as an understanding. And this is a very difficult mindset to detract from because we, particularly in organizations and conference settings like this, we are communicating at that understanding level. We are sharing statistics. The back of the room is filled with these wonderful posters that have excellent information, and you want to share that information, but that is a step too far. 
or boast to the general public, to get a visceral value-based belief systems ingrained in people, they will go to the next step. And they will read your posters, and they will really continue to develop an appreciation and a promotion of conservation ethic once that initial belief system is in place. This is, of course, a communication strategy that has long been recognized. In the 1950s, a social scientist, a social psychologist by the name of Leon Festinger, writing in 1950s language, said, a man with conviction is a hard man to change. Tell him you disagree, and he turns away. Show him facts or figures, and he questions your sources. Appeal to his logic, and he fails to see your point. Every single person in this room has had experiences to conform with this observation, and the trick is how to get conviction and beliefs built into the general populace that we're trying to get on side. And one of the strategies that has attempted to work in the past was sharing this vast array of information, thinking that will convince people. As a secondary characteristic, I believe that is the case. However, as a primary uh, form to, to engage an audience, I believe that is a step too far. That you have to bridge that gap with all sorts of other strategies. And that bridging of that gap is what I will be spending most of my time here this evening with you, giving different examples of how to bridge the gap between where you want the audience to go and where they are, using you as a using associative uh, values that they may possess in order to get and develop the conservation ethic in terms of people. So since I am giving a public presentation, and I want you to maybe remember a few things, or some people are certainly taking notes, I won't have a lot of charts or graphs. That will be noteworthy in any way, but you do kind of want to always keep in mind a few things to point out and I generated a list of seven categories that I've used in my work as engagement tools. And they all happen to start with an S, which is a little bit tricky. It's really wary on the old thesaurus to try to squeeze S's into this uh, category, and I generated a list of seven or so, but pretty much they all come down to being a good storyteller. They are, and I'll go through them over the course of my presentation, scaling sharing, softening, associating, and yes, I know that doesn't start with an S, but it certainly has a good S sound to it, so I hope you'll forgive me for that one. Storytelling, which is a big one, seducing, which is a very integral one, and finally, simplifying. These are all engagement tools that I've found effective over the course of my career to really break that barrier and incrementally introduce people to the ideals and wants that you are trying to generate. Scaling is the first one that I want to talk about, to lead off with. And I think it's really best represented by the incredible work of the documentary filmmaker, fellow by the name of Ken Burns. Uh, I'm sure most of you, of course, are very much familiar with his work, uh, his seminal work probably on the American Civil War, but certainly his documentary films, well, he did one just um, this year on the Dust Bowl, that I'm sure some of you who are interested in prairie conservation, Great Plains conservation, would be very interested in. I prefer his work on the U.S. National Park System, something like a nine-part uh, 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 documentary on the U.S. National Park Systems, which is simply outstanding. So he's primarily a historian, but I think his philosophy here uh, really correlates to what our grander agenda is here tonight. He said, the best of our history comes from the bottom up. What he means by that is vast stories, big stories, like the Dust Bowl, like the Civil War, like conservation, are best told small. It's not tackling these big, vast issues are you going to be able to engage people, but you're going to talk about the individual stories, the individual struggles of those people going through the Dust Bowl. As the U.S. National Parks were expanding and incorporating vehicular traffic into the ability of Americans to spread across the United States and visiting these, well, he profiled certain families that were doing just that. That's a very intrinsic, it's a very personal, and it's a very engaging way in terms of connecting to people. I find myself doing pretty much the same thing, not equating myself to Ken Burns at all. But when I traveled to Russia, boy, Russia is a place. I can tell you that. It's a strange place. It's a very foreign place. Its language is very cryptic, and its culture, of course, is very cryptic as well. It has a fascinating history that's quite foreign. 
even to most international travelers, and how to depict the history of uh, such a foreign place, from the concrete of Peter the Great around the year 1700s, establishing the Romanov line, the SARS, lasting a couple hundred years until Stalin had came in and Lenin came in and toppled in the October Revolution and then had in place the Soviet Empire, which lasted until just the closing years of the 20th century, and then you had an oligarchy come in. That's a very complex uh, history that I can tell by the eyes blazing over here in this auditorium is very difficult to grasp and very translatable. But I knew that most of the people who are going on the various tours in St. Petersburg and elsewhere in Russia would interact with very few Russian people, but they would interact with one type of Russian people. And anyone who has gone to Russia, any of the fabulous museums that St. Petersburg or other places have, the, uh, the, uh, the Hermitage Museum, the Winter Palace, as you can see there, Petersburg, Catherine's Place, would be attended by what I would call the Niet ladies. Yet me, no, because that's all they would really said. They would be beside every wonderful gallery, from the Rembrandt Gallery to the Da Vinci Galleries, and their only responsibility, it seemed, was to say Niet. If you were to hang around just a little bit too long in, certain, in, in, in front of a certain masterpiece, she would ask you to move on, see, yet. If you were to brush past something and actually make contact, which you shouldn't be making contact, perhaps even touching the velvet rope, she would come up and say, yet. These are amongst the most sour people I've ever met in my life. But introducing these characters to the people who would interact with them, you would get an understanding of the imperial system that's been in place in this country for 300 years, from the czars, this incredible disequity that has occurred not only in her lifetime, but the lifetime of all her ancestors, and the sourness is a reflection of not only the Romanovs and the Soviet Empire, but the new empire that has come around in Russia as well. Tell me a story, small, makes it much more visceral, much more contactable. I didn't sail into Canada too much, but it occurred to me upon one of my final sailings as a proud Canadian, how best to tell our story. The Canadian story is a big story. It's a huge story. Do I tell about the population numbers, the vastness, the area that the country covers? Well, I could do that, but anyone can do that. Wikipedia is very easy to find nowadays. But you want to tell the big story small. And I don't have enough time to share it with you. Do we have Americans in the audience, by the way? Not one, so I don't have to tell the story in any sort of detail. So I would tell my own story, and very quickly I would tell me as a 10-year-old kid. That's the guy right there with the hair and the ball cap. Probably the reason why I lost the hair and wore too many ball caps as a 10-year-old. And between Montreal and Ottawa, our family car passed a runner on the side of the road. The, car, the traffic was delayed for about 45 minutes, and as we pulled up to him, I saw a curly-haired man limping along on the side of the road. That, of course, I didn't know at the time, was Terry Fox. Because Terry Fox would eventually, of course, go into the city of Toronto and change his history, but also the history of Canada. And tragically, we also know that Terry Fox did not run past the backbone of Canada, Northern Ontario. The geological wonder that is that pre-Cambrian landscape broke his spirit as the cancer returned, and it broke our, all our spirits as well. But Terry, even though he died at 22 years old, he represents what the best of Canada has to offer. He represents the charity that Canada is known throughout the world for. His youth mirrors the youth of Canada, the immense task that he endeavored to take on the second largest country anywhere in the world, running 149 consecutive marathons, of course, mirrors the quality of the man and the quality of the nation as well, and of course, the great influence that Canada has throughout the world is mirrored in the work of Terry Fox, as you all know, with Terry Fox runs occurring in hundreds of countries across, across the globe, and his marathon of hope being very much continued to this very day. Don't have to tell Canada in terms of the statistical breakdowns, you tell Canada about the heart, and that's far more resonating, and I can assure you that every time I did it, I was close to tearing up every time on stage, and many audience members were doing the same thing. It was a connection, a connection that works, and that's the sort of thing that we're trying to do. We're trying to build a belief, something that reaches deep down and is very effective to people. 
Sharing, of course, is very important, incredibly important. Uh, share your knowledge. It's a way to achieve immortality. Well, I'm not suggesting if you share your work through the conservation community that the Dalai Lama is going to guarantee you immortality, but it will, of course, do a, long, a lot of good to, in fact, ensure that your work is spread. I first noticed this when I was doing my work in Thailand. As we were staking out visitor centers, we, it was uh, very obvious that whenever someone learns something new, they would immediately run back and share it with their spouse. I saw that uh, repeatedly during my presentation. When the lights are up a little bit more and you tease the audience along, allow them to get ahead of you a little bit and see the wife or the husband nudging each other, whispering into their ear that nugget of information that I have not yet shared with them. Sharing a tremendously important and compelling aspect that should be utilized as much as possible. And it's easier today than ever before, thanks to social media. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. But you must package information in shareable bites. So we're really talking about composing stories. And storylines and storytelling is really one of the most important aspects in terms of engaging people and getting people to have a convicted belief in what you are trying to pretend. Uh, Pixar, which is, of course, a moving company that every, uh, every parent in the audience would be very familiar with. Andy Stanton is one of the primary directors and writers of Pixar, did Wallaby and some of the Toy Story movies, and said, your job as a storyteller is to hide the fact that you are making the audience work for their meal. You sugarcoat it with these wonderful principles of storylines and storytellings that date back to the dawn of civilization. What were people doing when they were looking at the stars? They were conceiving stories of those constellations, explanations of their, creative, their, their, their beginnings of creation. Stories are an essential part of our language. It's how we communicate. And to master the art of storytelling and wrapping a message around it is some very, very good stuff to do. I'm 42 years old, but every single person under the age of 30 will instantly recognize this very opaque list of words that are seemingly from another language. Malfoy, Mandrake, Metamorph, uh, Magu, Mipulus, Mimul. I don't know, you guys know what it is, Muggle and Muffliato. Probably people over 55 or 60 without grandchildren are probably asking me, what the hell is he talking about? But everyone else will know that this is from Harry Potter. Exactly. A demonstration that in a well-crafted story, even incredibly opaque, and, and genus and species names, Latin names, can be retained because they are shared in a very sophisticated story format. And of course, Harry Potter shows us that, and showed, so does so many other aspects. So I don't buy the fact when people say that conservation principles are too complex for the general public or for children to understand, because they know what a mouflado is, and I don't. It's the craft in which we are sharing it with them is deficient and not as sophisticated as excellent storytellers that we have in the popular media. Seducing, of course, is one of our main aspects, and I got the word as a result of a quote from Lawrence Krauss. Lawrence Krauss is one of the primary public intellectuals around today, and he said, the only way to reach people is to seduce them, to go where they are, to get them interested. He is the author from the universe from nothing. You think conservation is tough to sell. This guy is pretending that the universe came from nothing. And he's a physicist, he's an astrophysicist, so he's doing a really good job of it basically equating that the total energy of the universe with dark matter and light matter actually equals zero, so it actually is feasible that you could have a net near zero. But this public intellectual is really very good at understanding that in order to connect to people, it's not all about equations. And I learned that firsthand in the publication of this little book here, which went in and sell a whole bunch of copies which really allowed me to get tremendous amount of feedback. Still, almost every week, someone's coming up to me and saying one thing or another about the book. But what they're never commenting on is the dense information that's contained in the bottom of the book. No one 
robin's coming up to me and saying, wow, that's great that the robin, you know, measures 24 centimeters long. What they all comment on is the engaging storytelling aspects on the top, the experiential things that John and I shared in order to connect to the audience, and that was the one great success of it. It's not that information is important, it's terribly important. If you were to make policy decisions, as many of you guys are involved in doing, absolutely we want the best, most up-to-date information available. But as Eric Smith, the CEO of Google, reminds us, the human race generates more data every two days than we did for the dawn of civilization until 2003. And the thing is, the information is more easily available than ever before. I'm interested in documentary filmmaking and the Hinterlands Who's Who series, which many of you are familiar with, in the 1970s and 1980s were almost exclusively offering information. Information that is unavailable, was pretty much unavailable to this day. Clearly I'm walking around too much making the glass jittery. Um, but nowadays, of course, anyone who is seeking any sort of information to correspond with a belief system will find it very quickly and very Faster, but also it is free. And if there's one thing I've learned during the course of my uh, somewhat uh, inconsistent career is that when you value something free, that is the, the value that it actually uh, attains. So the fact that we've cheapened the information because it is so easy to make available, the stock and trade of just sharing the information with the general public no longer has the punching power that it once did. George Dyson, who's a science historian who's looked and studied these things, he says, we now live in a world where information is potentially unlimited. Information is cheap, but meaning is expensive. Only human beings can tell you where that is. And this is the key point of this whole presentation. In the past, we have been trying to convince through reason. There's nothing wrong with reason. That is why we are here gathered at these conferences sharing high-minded ideals. But there's other aspects that are appealing to the human spirit. That's things that we call heart. We all know these actually generate the brain just right alongside the reason component. But of course, there's gut feelings, and then even below that, there's kind of a deeper feeling as well. The brain themselves, the cerebral cortex, is pretty much where the reason, the intellect comes from. And then deeper, more reptilian parts of our brain are, are mammalian parts of the brain, or where these other sort of things are generated from. Now, traditionally, I think we've relied too much on that reason argument, whereas we were ignoring these other arguments here. Look at the State of the Union address that Barack Obama and his whole political campaign. There was, of course, a reference to the reason argument but when he was invoking the 100-year-old woman who waited eight hours in line to vote, that was not a reason-based argument. That was the first level of argument, and I would, argue, I would argue that Abraham Lincoln, in fact, had it right in the 1860s. In order to win a man to your cause, you must first reach his heart, the great high roads, to reason. Following up on that, Chris Mooney, who writes a lot about this stuff, not only in Mother Jones, but he's got several books out, you don't lead with the facts in order to convince. You lead with the values in order to give the facts a chance. Once again, I am not, absolutely not, disregarding the value, the need, the necessity for the best science available. But just don't lead with it when you're trying to inspire a novel and general audience. Simplifying is something that is very important to do. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough, is what Einstein thought about it. Go back to the astrophysics these highly complex things that challenge the Newtonian laws of logic and reason, well, they come up with wonderful simplistic words. Things like Big Bang, Black Hole, Light Year, Wormhole, Dark Matter. Biologists have no comparables. Photosynthesis, evolution. Come on, let's come up with some better words to make it more appealing and approachable to the people. And I think one example that we have out here in the hallway, and I've already apologized to my friends with ASRD, -E is the information dump that we often want to do in order to convey our message to the public. It is not needed. This is a poster, a two-sided poster, by the way. On one side, it has 575 words. It's a wonderful website. But a poster, which is supposed to be inherently engaging, on the back side of the poster, for those who have x-ray vision and can peer through the paper and read the back side of the poster, has a further 800 words, totaling almost 1,400 words. 
Compare that to the Declaration of Independence, perhaps the most important document written in American history or perhaps democratic history had less words. A country, a whole system of politics was unleashed in less words than we talked about boreal species at risk. Come on folks, we can do better than that. The author of the Declaration of Independence said it best. When the subject is strong, simplicity is the only way to treat it. There's a difference between simplicity and simplistic. Simplicity takes a great deal of sophistication. It is very, very difficult. The good thing about keeping it simple is, as recent studies have shown, information that is easy to process is more likely to be accepted as true as well. So if you want to be convinced, if you want to be convincing, keep it nice and simple. People are likely to learn this as well. These are the sort of things and strategies that I have used recently in an effort with the Alberta Conservation Association to build a series of vignettes, I guess. It's the first one that I'm going to show you. I'm just going to show you two is bighorn sheep. Uh, bighorn is, there's not a single number in the whole thing. Uh, what we're doing is themes and values with this. It is an Alberta-based project, so we're very much jingoistic in this approach in terms of building an association between Albertans, their pride of place, and their pride of uh, place and people. Alberta's Rocky Mountains are exactly what bighorn sheep love. And in return, bighorns make sure that sheep country is never boring. In good times, our fertile mountain slopes build their muscle and mass. These are needed for the eventual bad times. But before the sheep are tested by the land, bighorns are tested by each other. The battle of bighorn rams takes second place to none other. It is endurance, commitment, and strength that define the winners. These are animals to be proud of. As such, Alberta's bighorn sheep were chosen as our provincial men. They're a showcase of our shared landscape and a reflection of our shared character. ACA, conserving Alberta's wild side. So that's one here. The, eventually they'll be on YouTube and the, they'll actually be PSAs that will make it on broadcast. Though, but that's very different. Uh, there, we're talking about values, we're talking about things of pride, regional pride, we're not worrying about the information. Information is secondary. Once people are interested in bighorns, they can go to the AC website, they can go to your own website, and they can find that information in order for them to continue their journey. But we need something to get the ball rolling in order to start that journey. The second one is much more framed like a story. It is the prong horn, and it is a story that you're all very, very familiar with, the, uh, the management efforts that many local landowners have done in order to assure that. Remember, you are not the audience, the audience of the general public, that is probably never even heard of the prong horn. But this one is very well structured as a storyline with conflict, a story arc, and these sorts of things as well. Alberta's pronghorn. They cover a lot of ground. While they live only in our southeastern grasslands, Alberta's 20,000 pronghorn are always on the move. Some of our herds migrate more than 400 kilometers a year. But with each and every stride they take, there's a potential threat. For these wide open freewheelers, today's Alberta has many new barriers to their success. Barbed wire fences can be a problem. While scooting under the lowest wire, a pronghorn can get cut up. Alberta landowners are changing this and fitting their fences with a smooth, raised lower wire. This reopens our grasslands and allows Alberta's pronghorn to once again run free. The ACA, conserving Alberta's wild side. So that's another one that's based primarily on the, the values of freedom. Uh, and again, that's a little bit of a departure from the traditional way that we have been tackling these sorts of issues. And the great thing is that we have this great capacity to refer to the type of excellent work that uh, folks in this room and all of, of course, the prairie provinces, the prairie parts of the Great Plains are doing. You know, when Martin Luther King stood up on the Washington Mall on that great memorable day, he didn't stand up and wave a fact sheet around. He wasn't telling people about the statistics involved in racial discrimination. He talked about having a dream. 
And that's precisely what we should be trying to emulate when we're trying to conduct engagement exercises to get people to dream a little bit more through various approaches that I have shared with you. Because we have these great stories, we have these great associations, these great figures, these great people that we can learn and live on. And not only that, of course, we have the great information at the back end to which they can refer to, to make it simple to make it clear, to make it clean. These are the sorts of principles that will lead to effective engagement. If you choose to think just a little bit less like a storyteller, and maybe just a little bit more like a storyteller, you, like Joshua Bell in that subway station in Washington, D.C., will not just be fiddling your tune to audiences that just disregard you, but you'll be taking a stage in a concerto in front of a mass of people who will have engaged and believed exactly what you are trying to do. Thank you very much. Everyone.